While we've said it before, we'll say it again. Vladimir Putin is in trouble, and it's worse than you think. The man who has ruled Russia with an iron fist for more than 20 years finally jeopardized his own future when he invaded Ukraine last spring. That decision has led to a string of remarkable defeats and failures, which has exposed cracks in Putin's rule for the first time in decades. Now, a year and a half later, they are presenting enormous challenges that he might not be able to crush with force. From the outside, Putin's continued belligerence towards Ukraine and the West is puzzling, since it has left him in a far worse spot geopolitically than he was at the start of 2022. But as William Shakespeare once wrote, uneasy wears the head that lies the crown. Putin has been uneasy in his seat of power for many, many years. This insecurity has driven him to obsession and helped him turn into the ruthless, corrupt, and jingoistic dictator we see today, one who silences any dissent inside his country, has journalists and defectors abroad murdered in broad daylight, and even faced a brief rebellion from his own confidants earlier this year. He can't even admit that this is a war, violently suppressing anyone who doesn't refer to it as a special military operation. But all these mistakes and tactics have also exposed the cracks in Putin's rule. His miscalculations about Ukraine and his ability to succeed there have left him weak, isolated, and flailing. He faces simmering tensions at home, an exodus of young and talented individuals from Russia, and a conscript army seemingly incapable of attacking or defending well enough to win any real victories. And despite its slow pace, Putin now also faces a Ukrainian counteroffensive which may retake even the small parts of the country which Putin has been able to hold on to. While it's unclear how successful the effort will prove to be, the counteroffensive seems to be developing along three axes which could seriously challenge Putin's capabilities. One is the southern Zaporizhia Oblast, one to the east in the Donetsk Oblast, and the other around the destroyed northern city of Bakhmut. Ukraine also continues to launch cross-border raids into Russia's territory near the city of Belgorod, where Russian military bloggers have claimed that entire regiments have been wiped out. From all these sources and more, it's clear that Putin faces numerous challenges to his future and possibly his life. It's also clear that he cannot afford to admit that he's screwed up, as his efforts to crush dissent and keep the Russian people on his side have been intense. And yet even Putin has had to admit in recent weeks that the war he and his yes-men launched is going poorly. Ukraine's counteroffensive, which some have claimed is going poorly, has still been effective enough that Putin admitted on June 9, 2023 that, in recent days we have seen significant losses in Ukraine. While this is clearly understating things quite a bit, it's also among the very first times Putin has been forced to acknowledge his problems at all. From a brutal dictator, this is about as close as it gets to a mere culpa. And things don't look to be getting much better. Despite taking heavy losses in their initial assaults of Russian positions, Ukraine's armed forces have made significant progress in breaking through fortified defensive lines in the country's southeast. Specifically, the most notable gains have been south of the Dnipro River, which divides the half-liberated city of Kherson. Russian military bloggers reported that up to seven boats, each carrying six to seven people, had landed near the village of Kazashi Lahiri, east of Kherson city, on Tuesday, and broke through Russian defensive lines. It was claimed that the Ukrainian soldiers had advanced up to 800 meters after getting to the riverbank, though it appeared Russian forces had some success in fighting them back. The Russian-imposed head of the occupied part of the Kherson Oblast, Vladimir Saldo, claimed the Ukrainian raid had been repelled. However, the Institute for the Study of War (ISW), a think tank in Washington which closely tracks the conflict, said that it appeared that the limited raid may have had more success than Saldo had acknowledged. ISW wrote in a recent update that, the majority of prominent Russian military bloggers claimed that Ukrainian forces managed to utilize tactical surprise and land on the East Bank before engaging Russian forces in small arms exchanges, and Saldo was likely purposefully trying to refute claims of Ukrainian presence in this area to avoid creating panic in the already delicate Russian information space. The report added that satellite imagery suggested that a major battle had taken place and that by the end of the day on 8th of August, Many Russian sources had updated their claims to report that Russian forces retained control over Kazakhi Lahiri, having pushed Ukrainian forces back to the shoreline, and that small arms skirmishes are occurring in shoreline areas near Kazakhi Lahiri and other East Bank settlements. This development in the fighting also poses a major threat to Russian supply lines and the key transportation hub of Melitopol, which serves as a gateway to the still-occupied port cities of Berdyansk and Mariupol. 
If Ukraine is able to retake these cities, it could cut off Russian support to nearly a third of their soldiers, stationed in the southeast and on the Crimean Peninsula. There are already numerous reports of sabotage train lines between Crimea and Melitopol, which may be impacting Russia's ability to move troops and supplies from one city to the other. These attacks are also only a small part of the broader Ukrainian sabotage operations which continue across the battle space, as well as in Russia itself. There have been twice as many of this type of attack in the first six months of 2023 than in the entire previous year. Besides psychologically messing with Russian troops, operations like this also help to weaken key defensive positions. If Ukraine can use them to escalate into a full assault on Melitopol, Berdyansk and Mariupol, that will leave only a single reliable supply route from Russia into Crimea, via the already damaged Kerch Bridge. The previous attack on that bridge, which remains unconfirmed but has been attributed to Ukraine, proved that this is vulnerable to sabotage. From reports and footage, it appeared as though a truck bomb was responsible, one which originated from within Russia's own borders. If Ukraine can pull off another similar attack able to destroy the bridge, it will leave the tens of thousands of Russian troops in Crimea essentially stranded. Even more important, it will leave no way for Russia to move heavy equipment like tanks, artillery systems, and supply vehicles onto the peninsula. This could prove disastrous and severely limit Putin's ability to sustain the war effort. In addition to giving ground under Ukrainian assaults south of the Dnipro, Russian troops have also been forced to retreat on the northern and southern axes of the conflict, near the ruins of the city of Bakhmut. When the Russian PMC Wagner Group announced that they had finally retaken Bakhmut several months back, they also announced that their forces would be pulling away from the front line. This was likely due to the many months of heavy losses, which would also eventually lead Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin to stage his ill-fated mutiny against Putin back in July. Prigozhin announced that he was turning Bakhmut over to the regular Russian forces. Within days of this taking place, Ukraine began systematic attacks on both the northern and southern approaches to the city, working to encircle the Russian troops inside. Ukraine's Deputy Defense Minister Hanna Maliar recently stated that, in the Bakhmut sector, three square kilometers 1.2 square miles were liberated last week, and that, in total, 40 square kilometers 15.5 square miles have been liberated on the southern flank of the Bakhmut sector. But this may also continue to shift in Ukraine's favor, as the country receives more and more advanced military supplies from the US and NATO. Some of these have already arrived and been put to use such as armored vehicles like the German-made Leopard tanks and US Bradley fighting vehicles. Most weapon systems manufactured in the West come with advanced targeting and night warfare capabilities, which Russia has either too few of or lacks entirely. These capabilities have allowed Ukrainian forces to undertake a large number of successful night operations, something experts have recently started pointing to as a major factor behind Ukrainian battlefield gains. Another source of Ukrainian dominance has been the influx of US-made precision artillery, such as the HIMARS rocket system and GPS-guided Excalibur shells. These have provided Ukraine with the ability to target Russian ammunition depots, fuel production facilities, and command and control centers. Combined with the power of long-range Western rockets such as the British-supplied Storm Shadow missile, this has led to several devastating strikes far behind Russian lines. Just weeks ago, Ukraine struck two of the bridges in the Crimean Peninsula, with at least one hit by Storm Shadow missiles, according to Ukrainian and Russian officials. And that same day, Ukraine's Ministry of Defense released images confirming the arrival of Scalp EG missiles, the French version of the Storm Shadow. The weapons being delivered may also be even more powerful than publicly disclosed. A colonel in Kyiv's Air Defense Command, who was not named, recently told the Times of London that the missiles in Ukraine's possession have twice their publicized range, about 310 miles rather than 155 miles advertised by its manufacturer. There are still options for more powerful systems to be delivered as well. Biden is said to be debating the delivery of the ultra-long-range ATAC-Ms or Army Tactical Missile Systems. ATAC-Ms has a routine range of around 200 miles, as well as highly accurate precision targeting capabilities. Meanwhile, Russia has run so low on ammunition that Putin has been forced to turn to countries like North Korea and Iran to supply artillery shells, some of which are likely more than 50 years old. Reportedly, during a recent test of similar ammunition by North Korea, over a quarter of the shells failed to detonate at all. 
Iran is also selling their least expensive drones to Russia, including the Shahed-129, Shahed-191, and Mahaja-6 models, which Russia has used to launch indiscriminate attacks on civilian targets and energy infrastructure. While these drones are deadly and terrifying, they are unlikely to be enough to turn the tide of the war. With new Russian weaknesses being exposed every week, Putin also increasingly runs the risk of his top generals turning on him, or ordinary Russians rising up over the staggering losses and failure to achieve any real gains. The frustration over the war is becoming more and more noticeable, even among the tightly censored and controlled Russian media. Igor Strelkov is a former Russian intelligence officer who has boasted that he pulled the war's trigger by leading Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea and of ordering the torture and execution of pro-Ukrainian officials, police officers, and war prisoners in Donetsk. Until recently, Strelkov was a rising star in the world of pro-war Russian telegram bloggers. But after Prigozhin's mutiny, Strelkov posted, among other insults, that for 23 years at the helm of Russia was a nobody who could fool most Russians. Three days later, he was arrested by Putin's security forces. The discontent has even spread to members of the Duma, Putin's hand-picked group of cronies who form the Russian legislature. One of its most influential members, Konstantin Zachulin, even recently dared to criticize the war in an international forum. Zachulin, who boasts close ties to top leaders of the FSB, said at a conference on the future of Ukraine that Russia had so far failed in all its war efforts, and that some of them had become senseless. Referencing the popular Russian rationale for the war, he stated that the original aims were denazification, demilitarization, neutrality for Ukraine, and the defense of the residents of Donetsk and Luhansk. On which of these points have we reached results today? Not one. Combined with Prigozhin's well-publicized mutiny and flight to Belarus, episodes like this show a Putin who is beginning to lose his grip on the levers of power. In a recent analysis, Tatyana Stanovaya, senior fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center, said Prigozhin had effectively chipped away at Putin's power vertical, or ability to rule effectively from the top down. Because of this, she argues, turmoil from the war is now producing dozens of mini Prigozhins, who are not as smart as the caterer turned mercenary, but have become sure in recent months that post-Putin Russia is already here, even as Putin remains in charge. Putin also faces new international challenges to his authority and possibly freedom. Since even before February 2022, there have been numerous reports of the systematic abduction and relocation of children from the occupied areas of Ukraine. In March of 2023, this led to an arrest warrant for Putin being issued by the International Criminal Court on charges for war crimes. While not an immediate threat, these are further isolating him internationally, putting even his trips to non-aligned countries into jeopardy. For instance, in August, South Africa is hosting a summit for a meeting of the BRICS Group, a loose alliance of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But the month before, South Africa's government stated that Putin would not be attending the summit, and that Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov would attend instead. This was largely due to concerns over whether they would have to act on the international arrest warrant due to building public pressure. Developments like this isolate Putin even further, limiting the amount of places he can travel on state business and undermining his legitimacy as leader of Russia. And allegations of mass kidnapping are just the tip of the iceberg as far as war crimes are concerned. The Russian armed forces under direct control of Putin and his generals have been responsible for thousands of acts of torture and murder throughout the war and occupation of Ukraine. For instance, in the town of Bukha, on the outskirts of Kyiv, over 450 civilians were executed with hands tied behind their back and dumped in the streets. An inquiry by Radio Free Europe also discovered the use of a basement beneath a campground as a torture chamber. Many bodies were found mutilated and burnt, while girls as young as 14 reported being raped by Russian soldiers. This is just one massacre among hundreds, many of which are also being investigated by the International Criminal Court. Additionally, the US is currently hosting Ukrainian prosecutors to help them prepare to prosecute such acts. Ultimately, all of the horrifying violence can be laid at Putin's feet. This isn't just guesswork either. He's made it publicly clear, such as by giving medals to the unit responsible for carrying out the murders and other atrocities at Bukha. He has also received charges of ecocide for the destruction of the enormous Nova Kokovka Dam, while Putin called the move barbaric and denied Russian involvement. But investigations have all concluded that Russia was responsible, as it controlled the dam before its destruction, 
while experts have concluded that the breach was caused by an internal explosion of hundreds of pounds of explosives. The dam was designed by the Soviets to withstand a nuclear attack, making it highly unlikely that any missile could have caused the damage it sustained. The dam's destruction is yet another terrible crime for which Putin is to blame. The event also suggests several more implications of his growing desperation. For example, more than 80% of the drinking and agricultural water in Crimea came straight from the lake that the dam controlled via canal. Putin's likely destruction of the dam may signal that he is aware he could lose control over Crimea at some point in the coming months, and is unwilling to let Ukraine have it either. By some estimates, it may take more than a decade for previous levels of drinking water to return to the peninsula. This is the move of a desperate tyrant lashing out at enemies and lacking the long-term thinking necessary to hold on to power securely. Another factor, often discussed but still crucial, is the damage that Putin has done to Russia's economy and diplomatic presence around the world. Take oil. Russia has been one of the world's top three oil producers for decades, behind only the United States and Saudi Arabia. But the harsh sanctions, price caps, and export controls imposed by the US and Europe after the invasion have hit Russia's oil sector hard. This is despite Russia offering a massive $20 per barrel discount in the cost of its crude oil exports, in the hopes of using new buyers like India and China to replace EU members who have largely stopped buying. But that discount, combined with lower volume of sales, means a shortfall of over $65 billion per year. That's not to mention other price declines from the pre-invasion oil market. All things considered, Russia is likely to see a 2023 decline in oil and gas revenue of over $180 billion. A drop of this magnitude is likely to hit ordinary Russians, and possibly even the oligarchs, quite hard. The expenses of the invasion are also hitting the Russian economy more directly now. Putin recently imposed an extra 5% tax on extra profit made by Russian businesses, something which is basically determined by his cronies in the finance ministry. Another area Russia's economy has been hit hard is in its global military sales. Back in 2011, Russia nearly matched the US in volume of global arms sales. But as the country has become more isolated due to warmongering and its equipment has been shown ineffective, exports have plummeted more than 70%, with 2023 sales to only 12 countries. Western sanctions have also destroyed Russia's ability to obtain advanced computer chips for its modern military equipment, throwing doubt on whether it will be able to produce such systems for more than another year. That's not even getting into the enormous destruction of tanks, artillery, planes, and over 250,000 soldiers. All of this suggests one thing. Putin messed up badly. His war of imperialism has now turned into a series of self-inflicted wounds, which have brought Russia to its lowest point in decades, economically, militarily, and politically. With two new countries joining NATO and Ukraine's membership on the horizon, every aim of the war has become an abject failure. It seems likely that sooner, rather than later, these mistakes will eventually catch up to Putin and be his undoing. But what do you think? Will Putin's war end up pushing him from power? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.